Welcome everyone to the 64th edition of Bogleheads on Investing. Today our special guests are Victor Hagoni and James White, co-authors of a new book called The Missing Billionaires, A Guide to Better Financial Decisions. Hi everyone, my name is Rick Ferry and I am the host of Bogleheads on Investing. This episode, as with all episodes, is brought to you by the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy, a nonprofit organization that is building a world of well-informed, capable, and empowered investors. Visit the Bogle Center at boglecenter.net, where you will find a treasure trove of information, including transcripts of these podcasts. We have two special guests on our program today, Victor Hagoni and James White. They are the co-authors of a new book, titled The Missing Billionaires, A Guide to Better Financial Decisions. This is not another Me Too book by an investment advisor rehashing common rules of thumb. There's a significant amount of original thinking and deep thinking packed into it, and they challenge a lot of the conventional thinking in the financial services industry. Victor is the founder and chief investment officer of Elm Wealth, and James is the CEO of Elm Wealth. But prior to that, James was trained as a mathematician. He joined the hedge fund industry as a quantitative analyst, became a trader, and ultimately a portfolio manager. And Victor worked at Solomon Brothers in the 1980s and 1990s and became a managing director in the bond arbitrage group under John Merriweather, and then was one of the founding partners of Long-Term Capital Management, an extremely successful hedge fund that exploded in the late 1990s and almost took down the entire financial system. You can tell by listening to their voices that they have learned a lot in life and they have been humbled by the markets. And quite frankly, those are the people that I learned the most from. So with no further ado, let me introduce Victor Hagani and James White. Welcome to the Bogleheads on Investing podcast. Thanks for having us on, Rick. Thanks, Rick. Let's start with getting to know you both. James, can you tell us how you got to where you are today as the CEO of Elm Wealth? Well, I was a mathematician to start. I studied math in school. I had no professional background in finance or economics academically. And uh, you took a relatively standard route through the professional trading world. I started off as a quant and a researcher building complicated models for valuing exotic options, became a a trader, first a market maker, and then a portfolio manager at a hedge fund. And as I built some wealth, I became more and more interested in, in the questions of how to manage it well. And one realization I came to, which I think Victor will agree he came to also, is the realization that the things we were doing as professional traders didn't look very much like best practices for managing one's own wealth. And the practices were much less transferable than one might otherwise think. And so that was really what brought Victor and I together and this mutual interest in managing our own wealth and in particular in questions that I'd become interested in both from the professional trading side and from the personal wealth management side of optimal investment sizing. Thank you for that, James. Victor, uh, you have an illustrious background. I don't know if that's the word I would use. (laughs) I'll take you back to the beginning. I was born in New York. My dad uh, was from Iran, my mom American. I grew up in the States and then actually lived for a few years in Iran until the revolution, then lived in London. I wound up going to the London School of Economics, studied finance and econ there. And then found myself at Solomon Brothers in New York in those crazy 1980s. After a few years in research, I was asked to join the trading desk uh, working for John Merriweather. And I worked for John for the rest of my career at Solomon, where I became a managing director on the arbitrage desk. And then as a co-founding partner of LTCM, where I worked through the 1998 implosion 
and then cleaning all of that up. Then I took a long sabbatical. My three kids were really young. I was 38 and I needed to regroup and refresh. And I got to just have a great 10 years of freedom, spending time with my wife and kids, reading a lot, thinking about what I'd do next. And eventually I wound up deciding that I thought there was really a need for a um, smart, low-cost wealth manager that brought the ideas uh, that I had studied in academia to people to be able to, to get the benefits of those things. I lived in London for a long time and then moved back to the States about five years ago. And I'm living out in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, while James is in Philadelphia doing all the heavy lifting for our company. And yeah, I'll stop there. Well, I say illustrious because you are mentioned in a few books, Michael Lewis's Liar's Poker, which is the game they used to play at the Solomon Trading Desk, and also books on long-term capital management. The one I particularly like is When Genius Fail by Roger Lowenstein, uh, which are really great reads. I think that when you get into your book and you really start to understand it, it seems to me that a lot of the lessons that you were talking about earlier, uh, James, about you know, what was happening in this institutional world doesn't really relate to personal wealth. And one of the concepts in the book that you bring out right at the beginning is the idea of risk sizing. So I want to start talking about the book, and we're just going to go through the book. There are several parts to it. There's a lot of math in it, okay? So you can kind of skip over the math uh, and get to the real nuts and bolts of what these two are really saying. And, and there really is a lot of great information in here. So we're going to go through some of that today. We can't go through it all because there's just so much of it. The book is divided into four parts, and those parts are investment sizing, lifetime spending, and investing. There's a section on human capital, risk tolerance, and how they interwine with the markets and market risk and return. Basically, they call it where the rubber meets the road. And finally, there's a, a last section of the book, which is interesting. It's a lot of financial puzzles and pulls together a lot of the information in the book. And the last thing in the book is just an easy to read list of the core points that they're getting at. So let's start out with James. Uh, what does investment sizing mean? What we're really trying to get across there is the idea that for many people, a very large part of the investment process, maybe most of the investment process, is focused on the what question, what to invest in, what stocks to buy, what index funds to buy, questions like that. And there's a general assumption that, you know, if you find something really good to buy, then you should just kind of buy as much as you can of it, or more or less. And investment sizing, and our focus on investment sizing, is really trying to get across the idea that the question of how much deserves equal weight with the question of what. There are a lot of how much kinds of questions that are natural in finance, not just how much of an investment I should have, but how much mortgage should I take out? How much gains should I realize? There's a lot of questions in which rather than framing them as a binary, I should buy this or I shouldn't buy it, or uh, I should take out a mortgage or shouldn't take out a mortgage. Framing the question not as should I do it or not do it, but framing it as how much of this should I do is a much richer way uh, of thinking about investing questions, investing in broader financial decision-making questions. There was an interesting section in the book, closer to the end, but I'm going to pull it to the beginning, where you say you should avoid over-investing in highly confident assets, which basically means the more confidence you have that this risk is going to materialize into a high return, you actually should invest less in it. That's an interesting concept. Victor, can you explain this? Uh, sure. That place, what we're saying is that if you're really, really confident that you've got a great investment, then you should recognize that your wealth is actually higher than what's written down on paper today in your brokerage account. So if you're really highly confident of something being a wonderful, wonderful investment for you, you're richer. And if you're richer, then your downside, if that investment doesn't turn out as you expect, is greater. That we shouldn't just measure downside from where we start, but we should be taking account of the attractiveness of the opportunity set that's out there and, and also obviously our human capital too. But normally, 
taking account of how good the investments are doesn't really materially change our decisions. It's only when you're super confident, and we give the case of、uh, somebody that's very bullish on crypto assets. Who feels very confident that they're going to see a hundredfold increase or a twentyfold increase, with risk though that it might not materialize, but just they're so bullish on it that they don't really need to own very much of it to be very wealthy. <laughs> And、uh, if things don't turn out like that, they've sort of taken a big hit from their expected、uh, place. I'd just like to add that the assumptions here were not just that you're super confident, but that you are super confident. And the expected returns are super high. Yeah, you're super bullish and super confident. Well, you could be super confident that a zero coupon treasury bond in ten years is going to mature at the expected par value, and that's not a a risk. But what you're talking about is the more confident you are in a risky asset, that at some point you should actually invest less money in it than it may be if you were less confident. I just found that to be extremely interesting. Let me ask you about. Why people ignore facts when they're investing, and I I look at active versus passive debate between active mutual funds and index funds, and for decades, active funds have underperformed index funds. In fact, I wrote a book called The Power of Passive Investing, and I did the history of this active versus passive debate, going actually back to the 1920s. There's data back there, and the data is clear and consistent for a hundred years. That if you just index the markets, I know you didn't couldn't do that back in the 1920s and 1930s, but if you could have, you would have outperformed. Now this data is everywhere. Standard and Poor's indices puts out the Spiva report. Morningstar puts out a report every year. Vanguard puts out a report, and yet active management still persists. What's going on?、Uh, let me take a crack at that. I think that. It's really just baked into human nature.、Uh, hope springs eternal. We tend to find it really difficult to objectively assess our own capabilities and abilities, and we just hate to view ourselves as being average. So I think that so many people who are attracted to、uh, active investing and, and owning concentrated portfolios. They would not argue with Sharp's、uh, arithmetic of active investing that all active portfolios combined equal the market portfolio, and hence will earn the market return minus fees. And it's even worse than that because, on average, all those portfolios are riskier on average than the market portfolio. So you're getting hit from fees, and you're taking more risk. And we know from what we talk about in the book that risk is as real a hit to your. Returns as is paying fees or taxes, but I think it's just this human nature thing that yeah I know that it can't work for everybody, but I'm going to make the right decisions and get the right active managers, and of course it also doesn't help that you know 99% of the people who work in the financial industry. Are kind of on the active side of things, one way or the other, and there's only a small group of people that are、uh, proponents and write about sensible investing. I don't want to call it passive investing; it's really active investing versus highly diversified, sensible <laughs> investing. It's not passive. You're making an active decision to invest in low-cost index funds. I'd add a, a different element. We wrote an article once called "Is Vanguard More Rolls Royce or Hyundai?" That was premised on a, a thought experiment by one of Vanguard's former CEOs, Bill McNabb, and he highlighted, we thought very rightly, an element of consumer behavior, which is that we're just very used to, as consumers, the idea that when we pay more for something, we're going to get a higher quality thing. He says, you know, if you buy a Rolls Royce, it really is more car than a Hyundai, and that consumer instinct works well for many things, but doesn't work with investment management. We take a few pages to address criticisms of market cap weighted index investing, and just some of the criticisms of index investing are、uh, so weak. And we thought it would be a good to at least have that in there in the chapter called "Into the Weeds." There was a great list that you put together of all of the fallacious arguments against indexing and why those arguments don't really make any sense. Let's go back to the idea of risk sizing. How does the individual investor use this risk sizing idea? How do they decide how to 
choose the percentage they should have in various uh, riskier assets or uh, how much of a mortgage to take out. You start this whole analysis by looking at what's something called a lifetime expected utility, and you really spend a lot of time on this equation. So it is a little complicated. I'm going to ask James to break it down to a third grade level so that I can understand it. Yeah, so, you know, one uh, one disservice that many people are done is that when a lot of people encounter concepts of utility in Econ 101 or, you know, wherever they encounter it, it often seems like it's just this very abstract mathematical formalism that is very hard to intuit and that 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 doesn't really get at anything, in, you know, real. But we have a strong view that that that's more of a pedagogical flaw and that actually what concepts of utility are getting at is something really fundamental in human nature. And a parable we use in the book is that, for example, I'm a big rock climber. And when I'm driving back from a a day of rock climbing, I often treat myself to some gummy bears. They're the, sorry, they're the candy type of gummy bears, right? Yeah, the Haribo gummy bears, specifically the sour ones. And, you know, I have a pack of them. I'm in the car. And the first one is really good. I mean, it's really, really good. And, you know, the the first several are really good. But then by the time I get most of the way through the pack, they're still good. I'd rather have another one than not. But it's just not the same. And by the time I'm down to the last one, I'm really almost indifferent between eating it or not eating it. The fancy term economists would use for this is diminishing marginal utility of consumption. In this case, specifically with respect to gummy bears. And we argue and we believe that this is not just some random abstract thing, but this is really deep in human nature and that our experience of consumption for our desires to be self-regulating really has to be like this. You know, if you think about the opposite, Let's say the more I had of something, the better and better it got. That really leads to behaviors that look like addiction, you know, not self-regulation. So this concept that we experience diminishing marginal benefits from consuming things, be it gummy bears or anything else, we think is a really deep part of human nature. In the book, we're really interested in one thing we consume, which is money and the diminishing marginal benefits of spending. And at a very high level, you can think of uh, a lot of the ideas that are in the book is just being motivated by this recognition that we experience diminishing marginal benefits from wealth, from spending. And in making financial decisions, we need a framework that accurately accounts for that feature of, of, of our nature. And the, um, you know, what we call the lifetime expected utility framework, or when we talk about discount lifetime expected utility of consumption, we're really just talking about accounting for that feature in a systematic way. Victor, can you give us your comments on how you might use this utility function to determine what your allocation to equity might be. This risk aversion that James is talking about, it's uh, particular to each one of us. We have our own risk preferences. And the idea really uh, that we talk about in the book is to try to calibrate your risk aversion in the context of things that are kind of easier to think about than the more complex decisions around investing in stocks, where your views of the behavior of stocks and stock markets is going to be pretty nuanced and complex. So we start off by saying, try to imagine different kinds of coin flips that you could do where you're risking some of your wealth. And that allows you to calibrate your degree of risk aversion and then to apply it consistently once you come up with your expectations for the expected return and risk of investing in equities relative to a safe asset. And maybe this is a good place just to say that the overarching approach of our book, we talk about it right in the beginning, we say we're trying to teach the reader how to fish. We're talking about how to fish, and we're not giving any recommendations specifically about what you should do in investing, but rather to give you a framework to make all these different decisions that are right for you. And I think that that's a real departure 
from many books in personal finance that say if you feel like you're uh, pretty typical, then put 60% of your money into equities and of that two thirds in US equities. We don't do that. You know, we really are saying, let's help you to think about a framework for all of these decisions that you're making under uncertainty. Well, let's dig into this uncertainty idea a little bit because you're, you do deviate from Boglehead belief on asset allocation. I mean, most Bogleheads follow a fixed asset allocation, like you say, 60-40 or whatever is right for them based on their needs and tolerances for risk and many other factors as well. But you're not advocating for that in your book. You're using a variable asset allocation strategy uh, based upon market valuations relative to someone's risk aversion. So it's two things, market valuation and risk aversion. So I'm going to come at it from two directions, the formal theory and also intuition. Intuitively, I think it's clear to most people who've thought about risk in a substantive way that you need to get compensated for taking risk and that the amount of risk you want to take should be proportional to the amount of compensation you want to receive. Let's say the only things in my opportunity set are the broad U.S. stock market and long-dated tips. Well, if long-dated tips have a, a real return of 3% and the broad stock market has an expected real return of 3%, why should I take all of that equity risk to get the same real return I can get risk-free. On the other hand, if I think uh, if tips have a real return of zero and the broad stock market has an expected real return of 5%, maybe I should take quite a lot of risk to get that very large pickup in expected return between the risk-free asset and stocks. So that idea is pretty intuitive, we think. And it also agrees with what the formal theory says which is that the amount of risk you take should be proportional to the risk premium, which is the excess return you're getting relative to the risk-free asset. How that translates into your investment portfolio will depend on what you believe about the expected returns for equity markets vis-a-vis risk-free assets. If you believe that that risk premium is constant, and you believe that the risk of owning equities is also roughly constant, then you would want a constant equity allocation. On the other hand, if you believe that the risk premium uh, varies over time, or that the risk of owning equities varies over time, then that would, I think, both logically and philosophically imply optimally having a time-varying equity allocation. From a Boglehead standpoint, we do know what the real return from tips are. I mean, that information is available minute by minute. But what we don't know is what the expected return of the stock market is at any given time. And if we wanted to estimate what we thought it would be, we do know that there's a lot of variation around that and that we could be wrong and could be wrong for a very long time. So rather than being wrong, We'd rather just have a fixed allocation and rebalance to it periodically. Victor, can you speak to this idea? So, you know, we recognize that this idea of dynamic asset allocation is a departure from how many investors in index funds feel that they should do their asset allocation. But the idea that you should have exposure that reflects a combination of your view of the future in terms of expected returns and the riskiness of inv- investing in stocks and your own personal risk aversion is pretty conventional thought within academia. And even John Bogle himself had written you know, in a number of places that it's important to quantify and to estimate the expected excess return you're going to get from owning equities. And he wrote a paper, I think it was in 2015, where he went into some detail about how he likes to estimate the long-term real return of the stock market using a combination of the dividend yield 
and earnings growth to come up with a very, very long-term expected return. So when we make decisions that we always want to make good ex-ante decisions, you know, ex-post, the whole idea of making decisions under uncertainty is recognizing all of the uncertainty that's out there. And so, you know, it shouldn't surprise us or make us criticize our own decisions when we get a bad outcome. So one really strong example that I like to think about is imagine that you're betting on a biased coin and the coin has a 60% chance of landing on heads and you decide how much you want to put at risk in that coin flip. So you do that for a while and then somebody comes and says, okay, now I'm going to give you a different coin. Now this one is programmed to just give you a 55% chance of landing on heads. And you say, okay, fine. Well, obviously, I'm going to bet less on this less favorable coin. So you bet less on it. And then it turns out that you got like, you know, 60% of the time heads came up, you know, because that's just the lucky outcome. You flipped it 10 times and you got six heads, even though the probability was 55%. And then you would say, oh, gosh, I wish I didn't reduce my uh, betting size when I found out that this was a less attractive coin. Well, sure, you, we always wish that we could have more money, but you still made the right decision regardless of the outcome. You know, the outcome could have gone the other way too. So, you know, I think separating decisions and making good decisions from the outcomes is really, really important in making good financial decisions under uncertainty. And, and I would add that, you know, that's really the same whether you are using a static or a dynamic asset allocation. Well, it is a complex idea, so I'm going to reframe it to say that it sounds like what you're saying is if you take a fixed allocation to a risky asset and the riskiness of that asset is changing, then you need to change your asset allocation so that you have a consistent amount of risk allocated to it. Right. And and if I could just speak to that for a second, you know, you make an asset allocation based on current conditions, you know, maybe... The expected return of equities is 5% in excess of the safe asset and, and you're seeing, you know, daily volatility of 1% a day. The market's moving around by on average 1% a day and you decide how much you want to allocate. Well, if the market starts to now move around by 2% a day, in our view, you should reduce your exposure to equities and we would just call it making the right prospective asset allocation decision based on the circumstances. The important thing and the real difference between just having a a systematic approach to adjusting your allocation based on expected return and risk is that built into this approach, you also have the time that you're going to go back and get yourself back to the old asset allocation, the higher allocation to equities. And and then when you get into some period when the market's just moving around by a half a percent a day, you would even have more equity exposure in that environment. So you're moving your exposure around. And sure, uh, the market tends to be more volatile when it drops and you're going to reduce exposure there, but you're going to get back in. And And history and common sense shows us that, that this is a really good way of investing. And if you're doing it as part of a systematic program where you're looking at the riskiness of the market and you're making adjustments when it gets riskier or less risky, you're decreasing or increasing. And the same with expected returns relative to the safe asset It's a very comfortable kind of way to do your investing over time, we think, because you're responding to the world. You're not just basing it on the last hundred years of history as if as though the future will be the same as it was on average over the last hundred years. Well, I get what you're saying, that taking an allocation to stocks based solely on a risk tolerance measure without any consideration to the amount of risk in the stock market at the current time uh, may be a flawed approach in your view. However, your second alternative or your alternative to that, you still agree doing a fixed allocation to stocks, bonds, and cash also works. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's better than the third alternative, which is you know spending your life doing all kinds of active trading and based on what's happening in the news cycle and what you're seeing on CNBC, et cetera. Yeah, I think the static asset allocation is a very close second to what we're suggesting. You know, I would say in general, our experience with advising people about investing is that conditional on what you're doing being sensible to start with, then the best can be the enemy of the good in that doing what you're comfortable with, again, conditional on it being sensible to start with, is legitimately and rightly a really important factor in how people should be investing. 
There are a lot of thought-provoking ideas in the book, and one of the ideas that you talk about is, are you a bond or are you a stock? And what this is, is talking about human capital. Is what you do for a living risky, meaning your income can go up and down with the economy? Uh, let's say that you own an auto dealership, for example, or you work at an auto dealership, and you know when things are bad, things are bad for you. Or you work in the healthcare industry where people get sick regardless of how bad things are. So in one case, the person who works at the auto dealership is a stock and the person who works in healthcare is a bond. So that has a lot to do in the book and you make the case in the book for how risky your portfolio may be, or at least to be a consideration. James, can you talk about this? This is another area where what you get intuitively and what the formal theory tells you converge really well. If you come back to thinking about wanting to follow a proportional spending policy, then it's pretty intuitive that if I have an income stream which is very fixed, or which is very knowable, doesn't vary very much with the markets, then that's very different than if I have an income stream which is highly variable. For example, being a doctor or a professor, where I'm 35 and I have a very predictable income for most of the rest of my working life, at a minimum level at least, and what I'm earning has very little relationship to market returns, that's a much better position for taking equity market risk than if, for example, I'm a stockbroker, where my earnings naturally have a lot of market volatility in them. So if I think of my human capital is basically just the present value of my future earnings, and I think of that as an asset. Well, if I'm a professor, that's going to be like a very low risk asset on my balance sheet. And I can take a fair amount of additional risk. Whereas if I'm a stockbroker, that asset looks just like owning a lot of equities already. So the amount of financial equities I want to own will be less because on my balance sheet, including capital, I'm already owning a lot of equities just through my income, basically. Well, now that you know what your asset allocation should be, whether you do it dynamically or you do it statically, uh, one part in your book talks about whether you should just lump sum, get invested, or whether you should gradually dollar cost average your way over. Victor, could you talk about this? From a cold logic point of view, you should figure out where you want to get to and then just go there. That makes the most sort of rational sense. But what we've come to find and what we often advise clients is that just having a plan for putting that money into the market over some period of time might be a lot more comfortable. So putting in 152nd of it each week for a year uh, or a 12th a month for a year or doing it over three months, that you're not giving up a lot as a long-term investor to average your way into the market and to reduce the possibility of being left with a bad taste that you invested in it all right at the beginning and then the market is down 5% the next month and it just leaves you with some discomfort about the whole process. So even though it's not uh, logically optimal to scale it in over time, it can make sense to do that for people that are so inclined. What's really important though is not to follow a plan that might have you never investing it, right? So sometimes people say, okay, I've got this money. I'm going to go 20% of the way to where I want to go right now. And then for every 5% lower the market goes, you put in another 10%. So, you know, I'm just waiting for the market to go down 25% and I'll get myself all the way to where I want to go. And that can be super costly to people if you follow that sort of thing. Like you want to follow an approach that gets you into the market in a reasonably short period of time, you know, maybe three months, six months, you know, maybe on the outside a year, you know, that's going to give you enough time to be able to look back and say the glass was half full rather than half empty, you know, give you some comfort that you didn't make a really bad timing decision. And another part of the book, you talk about management fees and the cost of a 1% AUM fee. James, can you discuss this? There's two things that are really pernicious about it. One is that the expected returns, you know, we earn from risky markets are risky 
but the management fee is not risky. Um, you know, so a uh, a one percent management fee is not offset by one percent higher expected returns. You actually need much higher expected returns to um, such that the risk adjusted extra return offsets the one percent certain management fee. Um, you know, but I, I think I think it, you can also think about uh, the the context, the magnitude of a one percent management fee, when thinking about an a, a common proportional uh, spending policy for most people. So, um, what the exact right spending policy is is going to depend on an individual's age and portfolio and financial circumstances and everything, but. You know, it's typical to see spending policies on the vicinity of you know three to five percent of wealth, and you know in that context, a one percent management fee, um, you know that's equivalent to a third of your annual spending or a quarter of your annual spending. You know, that's just that's an enormous amount. We're going to get to a spending policy in a minute, but before we do that, I'm going to pull forward from the book of the chapter on taxes. And I want to talk about taxes because they are a cost to the portfolio. And so, Victor, can you talk about taxes? Sure. So in terms of taxes, we really talk about taxes in two ways in the book. One of them is just that, you know, taxes can be like fees. In other words, that some investments are much more tax efficient than other investments, which can be very tax inefficient. So just thinking about the tax efficiency of what you're investing in is really important as you're thinking about the expected returns and risk of what you're doing. And of course, bearing in mind that, you know, in many cases, taxes, uh, capital gains taxes in particular, um, you know, take away your upside, but leave your downside like fully exposed. The government is not our partner in losses. It's only in gains. And so, uh, you know, that's important to think of, you know, in terms of uh, riskiness. Now, uh, we devote uh, some discussion to this question that so many people face of they have some highly appreciated low basis asset in their portfolio. Maybe it represents a really big part of their portfolio. I mean, so many people have Apple from the 90s, you know, and, and basically the basis is close to zero and it's done so well that it represents maybe 30% you know, 40% of their total portfolio, but they can't really, they still love the company and they just can't bring themselves to sell it and pay the taxes. And this is basically a question of, um, uh, of quantifying the cost to you of this extra risk of having a concentrated portfolio versus um, paying taxes sooner rather than later, or perhaps not at all. And uh, and so you want to use this framework that is explicitly putting a cost on risk in order to figure out what the right thing to do is. You just don't want to look at just the central case and figure out where you're going to have more money. Like, okay, uh, well, I'm just going to hold this forever. I'm going to get a step-up basis. And so obviously I should never sell it. No, you need to take account of this riskiness as part of the whole uh, decision too. And what we've found is that very often... Uh, it does make sense, even when you believe you're going to pay zero capital gains tax uh, far into the future, that it still makes sense to reduce sometimes these highly appreciated positions to get yourself, to get your risk of your portfolio closer to where you want it to be. And it's not a binary thing. It's not like sell all of that uh, and pay taxes on all of it. You know, that, that it, this framework that we put up in the book um, you know, helps you to figure out how much to do that would be optimal and that would really increase your expected welfare. And it's not just uh, in the case of um, it's not just in the case of an appreciated position in a single stock like Apple. It also can happen when uh, you made your investments in the market a long time ago and is in an ETF or an index fund. And that's appreciated so much that instead of having 60% of your money in the market, now you have 80% exposed to stocks and you're less bullish on them than you were 30 years ago when you put that money in there. It can still make sense using this framework to sell some of that to get yourself closer to where you would want to be if you were starting your portfolio today. So thinking about these tax decisions is a great application of this expected utility or this risk-adjusted framework 
that that we put up in the book. The second uh, part of the book is about spending, and it's a really great part of the book. And we got a lot of good ideas about spending and what money is spent on. James, can you give us some highlights? Yeah. So you know, one of the the really big picture things we hope we leave readers with is just the idea that investing and spending need to be thought about together and not separately. And that as advisors in our investment management practice, one of the things you know that we see causes real problems is when people don't do that, when people's investment choices are really divorced from their spending. And we think investment advisory practices often encourage that, unfortunately. To see why investing and spending are so linked, we start by talking about how an optimal spending policy should be proportional to wealth. And we're not advocating that, you know, somebody change their spending every day as their wealth goes up and down every day. But I think you can see how in the big picture, if your spending isn't somehow proportional to your wealth, that can lead to a lot of problems. If your wealth falls a lot and you keep spending the same amount, then obviously that's going to run down your wealth really quickly. On the other hand, if your wealth grows vastly and you keep spending the same amount, then you're just significantly underutilizing your wealth. So if you accept that even just in the very big picture, you want this proportional relationship between your spending and your wealth, well, that creates a relationship between the volatility of your wealth and the volatility of your spending. And one of the things that is, we would say, constrains your risk aversion that links your investing policy and your spending policy is that you want there to be this relationship between the amount of variability you can tolerate in your spending and the variability of your investment portfolio. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to follow a proportional spending rule. Victor, can I get your comments on spending? Yeah, I mean, as James said at the beginning, that ultimately our spending has to be linked to our wealth and to the performance of our wealth. And if we're taking risk, then we have to acknowledge that our spending in the long term is going to have to reflect that. But yeah, in the, in the short term, you don't need to be adjusting your spending quarter by quarter, depending on your portfolio returns. But it's just such a powerful example to think about this relationship between investing and spending and risk. And I just want to give you a really quick, a toy example, just to really see how uh, surprising some of this can be. You know, imagine that, that you have this investment portfolio, you really like it, and you believe that it's going to have a 5% real return. So you invest all of your money in this portfolio, and, and, and we acknowledge it has a 5% expected real return. And let's say, you know, you have a million dollars, you're retiring, uh, we'll put Social Security off to the side and say that's covering you. The only thing about this portfolio is it's got a 5% average annual return, an arithmetic return as we call it. But it's really risky because you built this portfolio up of the stocks that you really liked. Unlike most of our listeners, you know, the, let's take, we're taking the example of somebody that has a real concentrated portfolio. And we know that individual stocks can have 30 to 40 or even 50% volatility per annum. So here's this concentrated portfolio and it has 30% volatility of returns per annum, but it has this 5% return that you feel good about after inflation. You have a million dollars and you say, okay, I'm going to spend $40,000 a year adjusted for inflation as well. Everything, we can just ignore inflation, imagine it's zero. I'm going to spend $40,000 a year, which is less than the 5% return. And the question is, after 25 years of doing this, uh, what's the most likely amount of wealth that you're going to have? What's the median, your median wealth after 25 years? And it's very surprising to many people that the answer to that question is zero. There's an over 50% chance that after 25 years, you have zero wealth. And the way to see that is to recognize that if you've got this 5% return and you're going one year, you go up 35%, the next year you go down 25%, that's averaging out to 5% a year, but your compound return is getting killed by all that volatility instead of a 5% compound return, 
your compound return is just a half a percent a year because you go to 135, then down 25% takes you to 101 after two years. Meanwhile, you're spending $40,000 a year. So you're diminishing in the central case, your wealth is being diminished. And then once your wealth is diminished enough, like after 10 or 15 years, then it really starts to get diminished quickly. You go broke, as in the sun also rises, slowly at first, and then all of a sudden, and that's exactly what it looks like. It's sort of a toy example, but it really shows a lot of things going on in terms of this importance of having an investment policy that makes sense and a spending policy that's connected to it in a meaningful way. Otherwise, you know, you just get dissipated so quickly by not having those in sync. Um, you know, if you think about capitulating as uh, basically be de-risking not because you want to, but because you feel like you're forced to. One thing that often causes that, we think, is that in that you kind of systematically forces people to de-risk at the bottom and then not get back in because they, they feel like they were forced into it is because they had uh, a relatively risky portfolio but were not able to follow a variable spending policy. And so if you just think about your portfolio risk from a psychological standpoint, as many kind of investment advisors encourage, you know, the questionnaire, how tolerant are you to losses? People think, oh, you know, I'm very psychologically tolerant to losses. But then when you have a big loss, before you were spending 5% of your wealth, the market falls a lot, you were heavily invested, now you're spending 10% of your wealth. And people just think, oh, I just can't afford to lose any more. And so you're forced to de-risk. Whereas if you were able to vary your spending policy so that, you know, your wealth fell 50 percent, you were able to cut your spending a lot, too. You wouldn't suddenly be spending twice as much of your wealth every year and be in that position where you were forced to de-risk just to avoid losing anything more. There's a few ways in which you could immunize this risk. And one is to have set amount of income coming in, Social Security, perhaps uh, an annuity. Uh, you can get income from bonds. And a lot of people rely on dividend income from their stock, but you're not an advocate of using dividend income as a way to immunize basic needs. Could you comment on that, Victor? Sure. Look, subsistence and basic needs, those are expenditures that we just can't take any risk with. That is exactly what they are by definition. And so they need to be covered somehow by very low risk investments. And so we think that you should be allocating some amount of your portfolio. Maybe it's uh, into uh, government bonds. Maybe it's tips. Maybe it's a, uh, an annuity, you know, depending on your circumstances to really cover those in a very low risk manner. More generally, we feel that trying to think about uh, spending policies and investment policies in terms of income versus capital makes things unnecessarily complicated in some ways and, and leaves us at the mercy of different dividend policies from different companies. It's going to lead us to less diversified portfolios. And it, I think it's just going to lead us to various suboptimal decisions. It's just better to think really simply and clearly about expected returns on a, a real basis after inflation and not to think about income in nominal terms and dividend policies and, and all of that. I think that can really lead us to income-focused kinds of investing take us to the wrong place very often. That income and capital are fungible, you know, away from some tax issues sometimes. And we should really be agnostic to how our returns are coming. Are the returns coming in the form of capital appreciation or dividends? The important thing is how risky are they and what our expectation is for how big the total return is going to be relative to safe assets and after inflation. Right. Okay, it's time for the lightning round. And this is where I ask you about certain asset classes and you tell me what your thoughts are. So let's start. Victor, T-bills. Why are T-bills not the risk-free rate? Well, we think that for people that have a long-term horizons, they uh, should care about the long-term inflation-adjusted spending that their wealth can support. And that means that the safest assets are things like tips. And, and with treasury bills, you know, we're not locking in a real rate of return. And, and historically, we can see these periods where investors lost a huge amount of their purchasing power 
by being in bills in the late 1940s. And then just very recently, people have lost 25% of the purchasing power of their wealth if they had their money in T-bills from the period when rates went all the way down to 2% and below. Next asset class is foreign equity. Should people include foreign equities in their allocation or not? James. We think you should uh, for several reasons. The philosophically most diversified portfolio is the global market cap portfolio, just like if you're, you know, if you're only looking at U.S. stocks, the most diversified portfolio to hold is the market cap weighted portfolio of U.S. stocks. International equities offer a meaningful extra dimension of diversification for people. And we think that's especially important because outside of liquid investments, most people in the U.S., are already very heavily tilted to the U.S. Your human capital is all in the U.S. Your residential real estate is usually in the U.S. Any investment real estate you have is usually in the U.S. And liquid global markets are really the only place where you can get this meaningful diversification away from the U.S. very efficiently. Victor, let's talk about home ownership. Is owning a home just a place to live or is it an investment? It's both, (laughs) but we think that it makes sense to think of it as an investment that you're renting from yourself and to take account of that in your overall asset allocation with your financial assets, your house, and your human capital. James, commodities, artwork, collectibles, cyber currency, investments that have no cash flow. Pass. Pass on them or pass the question? (laughs) <laughs> I was joking. But with a kernel of truth, we think those uh, assets like that are, are just much, uh, much more difficult to analyze. And for us, we choose not to invest a lot in them. If you have your own forecast of expected returns and risk for assets like that, then you can incorporate them into the framework we talk about in the book, just like with other assets. But we think getting to those estimates for assets without cash flows is more difficult and more uncertain. Last one. Victor, factor investing. Well, we wrote a lot about that in the book. I think that just for a quick yes or no, we would tend to pass on that. We think the extra complication, the extra worry is is probably not worth it. If it is worth it, it's worth it in a really small way. Uh, Two more questions. The ultimate two-fund portfolio. You have it in your book, a total global equity fund and a long-dated tips fund. James, can you comment? If you believe that the assets you're investing in have normally distributed returns, more or less, and make other standard assumptions about your utility function, but you know, let's just say that for, for normal assets and you know, normal risk preferences and whatnot, there's a really nice result that you can decompose the investing process into two steps. One is take all of the risky assets in your opportunity set, whatever they may be. But, you know, for us, it's global equity markets. But for any individual, it's, you know, whatever they consider in their opportunity set. And the first step is find the portfolio of risky assets, which maximizes its sharp ratio, which basically means it maximizes its ratio of excess return to risk. Then you take that, you treat that as your risky portfolio, and you can use a rule of thumb, what we call the Merton share, to figure out what fraction of your wealth to put into the risky portfolio, and then what fraction to put into the risk-free asset. So you just explained the Tobin separation theorem. That's right. And the last question is for Victor. The name of the book is called The Missing Billionaires. How'd you come up with that name? Well... The Missing Billionaires goes back to a TEDx talk that I gave about seven or eight years ago, where basically I tried to use the fact that large pools of capital tend to dissipate really quickly. That Today, there are very few billionaires in America that trace their wealth back to wealthy ancestors, grandparents, great-grandparents, whatever, back at the beginning of the 20th century. So even though the investment environment in the U.S. was just amazing over the last 125 years, that families that had 5, 10, even $100 million back then 
have not really been able to maintain and preserve and grow that wealth in a way that you would have expected a good number of them should have been able to, and then we'd have all these extra billionaires today. Now, we're not saying that's a shame that we don't have even more billionaires today, but it's indicative of a problem in decision-making under uncertainty, problems in good decision-making, we think. And so that's the puzzle that kind of motivates the discussion in the book. I mean, once we talk about the missing billionaires in the first 10 pages or so, we get on to the subtitle of the book, which is a little bit more boring, but is really the main uh, aspect of the book, which is uh, making better financial decisions, a guide to better financial decisions. And the, uh, the missing billionaires is really this sort of parable that's a jumping off point that helps to uh, hopefully convince our readers that there's something you know that we need to do better and that some of these suboptimalities in our decision making can be really really detrimental over the course of decades you don't notice the problem over the course of a few years but you start to get into decades and it, you really see dissipations in your wealth well we've run out of time but we could probably go on for two more hours so victor and james thank you so much for being on the bogle heads on investing thanks for having us on rick thanks rick this concludes this episode of Bogleheads on Investing. Join us each month as we interview a new guest on a new topic. In the meantime, visit BogleCenter.net, Bogleheads.org, the Bogleheads Wiki, Bogleheads Twitter. Listen live to Bogleheads Live on Twitter Spaces, the Bogleheads YouTube channel, Bogleheads Facebook, Bogleheads Reddit. Join one of your local Bogleheads chapters and get others to join. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.